the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Back before I went to seminary, I was working as a sort of low-grade executive at one of the big studios in Los Angeles. And one Monday morning, I ran into a colleague of mine in the kitchen on our office building floor. He asked what I had done over the weekend, and I had said something pretty standard at that point in my life. On Saturday, I had dinner with a friend, or I went on a hike, or something like that. And on Sunday, I went to church, and then I went to the farmer's market. He set down his mug of coffee, and I watched his eyes widen in zeal. He lowered his voice. Are you, you know, a Christian? Yeah, I said, I, I am. And he leaned in a little closer, and I distinctly remember him looking around the kitchen to see if anyone else was there. Do you want to join our Bible study? Now this was surprising. A Bible study at one of the major movie studios in the city of Los Angeles. Sure, I said. And my colleague was thrilled. OK, awesome, he said. I'll send you a calendar invite. Not 10 minutes later, I'm back at my desk, and I saw that, sure enough, a Google Calendar invite had popped up in my inbox. Wednesdays, 1 PM, Jack Cohen Building, conference room 309, production review. The calendar entry for the film studio Bible study was officially called production review. Anyone who had access to your schedule, your assistant, your boss, your agent, whomever, anyone looking at your calendar could see that on Wednesdays at 1 p.m., your time slot was blocked out for a production review. Of course, that very next Wednesday, I made sure to bring my Bible with me to work that day, and at 10 minutes to 1, I closed my computer and found my way to the correct building, conference room 309. Outside the room, a little screen displayed the names of the room reservations, and sure enough, at 1 p.m., there it was, production review. I went inside. As the minutes passed, the conference room filled. There were assistants, producers, craft services coordinators, casting agents, editors, and I was shocked, one of the most famous, well-known executives at the studio. He took the seat across from me, and I wanted to be swallowed by God's earth when he asked me, laughing, does your boss know you're here? <laughs> yes, I choked. Well done, he replied. Mine doesn't. This Bible study was, to this day, one of the strangest experiences I've ever had in my life, because it was good. We read scripture together. We asked phenomenal questions together. This stone-cold pack of Hollywood strangers came together around the word of God. We told stories. We made friends. We grew in wisdom and holiness. And everybody lied about it. We lied about it so hard that we couldn't even name the conference room for what it was. We lied so thoroughly that our calendars on any given Wednesday at 1 p.m. indicated that 35 to 40 studio executives were at some mysterious, unspecified, unbudgeted production review. Several of the members of the Bible study, in fact, joked that they met openly and frequently for AA meetings on the st in the studio, which were advertised far and wide, as they should be. AA meetings were absolutely fine and, in fact, expected, but we were all thrust into cloak and dagger subterfuge when it came to something like religion. Considering the events of today's gospel, I wonder if Nicodemus had lived in the 21st century and if Nicodemus had an up-to-date Google calendar, I wonder whether a portion of it, late into the night, might have been blocked out with a mysterious event labeled production review. 
I wonder if he would have quietly ex excused himself from the executive dinner with his fellow members of the Sanhedrin. Sorry, fellas, it's been a great evening, but I have a production review. <laughs> and then he goes quietly, secretly, to find Jesus. Nicodemus, perhaps, after all, could be considered a well-renowned well studio executive of his day. He was a prominent member of the Jewish community, a counselor, a teacher, a man of authority. He was a member, in fact, of the very council that would sentence Jesus to his death. People knew who he was, and people knew what he was about, and it would have been perfectly troublesome if anyone knew that he was curious about faith about Jesus. And so he comes to this compelling teacher in the obscurity of the night. He offers Jesus a generous compliment, and Jesus does not mince words. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. In some translations, this phrase is rendered, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. In fact, the word here in Greek can be translated both ways. It's a puzzle, delightful and infuriating for translators, but the truth of it is the text can be translated both ways. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Either way, profoundly unsettling. Nicodemus is not a fool, remember. When he asks Jesus, can one enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born? He knows this is not the answer. He offers, in fact, the most absurd rendering of what it is Jesus is trying to tell him with the intention of forcing this teacher into some moment of genuine revelation. If one cannot literally enter the womb again, what? Jesus, for mercy's sake, could you possibly mean? To be born of this world, Jesus knows, is traumatic. For those of us born into the flesh, that moment of birth is a trauma. When we are born, all of us, though generally unable to remember it, we are forced with little agency from a place of safety to a place that is at first marked by confusion and fear. But after the blood and the fear and the pain that our little baby consciousness right registered on some level of terror, we breathed air for the first time. We saw light for the first time. We were alive. We were a bundle of possibility, and nothing would ever be the same again. When Jesus speaks to Nicodemus about the need to be born from above, the need to be born again, this description that he selects here is deliberate. Approaching the kingdom of God requires nothing less than being reborn of water and spirit, a baptism. You will be moved at this baptism with little understanding from a place of safety to a place marked at first by confusion and maybe even fear. There may be blood, there may be terror, there may be pain, but you will breathe air for the first time. You will see light, the light that shines in the darkness and could not and will not be overcome. You will see this light and you will live. You will become a bundle of possibility and nothing will ever be the same again. Jesus does not withhold the stakes from us. To be reborn of water and spirit is not merely to live as a person composed of flesh, but this is to know a life that is eternal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. And this everlasting life, this life begins now. It begins with this baptism, water and spirit. Isn't it interesting how awful human beings are at thinking about time? 
We think about eternal life and we imagine it as this something that waits for us beyond the nebulous threshold of this life on earth in the flesh. And certainly it does. But it is also present and immediate to our lives as we have been found by Jesus Christ. We need only remember our brother Nicodemus to help us think through this. Now Nicodemus, as I told the children this morning, appears three times in the Bible. The first time he appears is the scene in which we find him today approaching Jesus by night in secret, perhaps with a calendar entry in his diary suggesting that he is attending an unbudgeted, mysterious production review. In secret, he finds Jesus by night and has this discussion about what it is to approach the kingdom of God. This is Nicodemus, scene one. The second time we meet him is just a few chapters further on in the Gospel from St. John. Chapter 7, when the chief priests and authorities are trying to arrest Jesus, and Nicodemus kind of speaks up. As they're about to arrest him, he says, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, does it? A general statement, perhaps, but a bold one. Something within him has already changed. Nicodemus, scene three. We find Nicodemus with Jesus after he has been crucified, after Jesus has died. Joseph of Arimathea, of course, asks Pilate for Jesus' body, and Nicodemus goes with him. The two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, are together. And not only does Nicodemus publicly, in the daylight, accompany Joseph to bring Jesus' body to the tomb for burial, he brings 100 pounds of aloe and myrrh. This man, this bold man, has gone from meeting Jesus in the secret of the dark to embracing his body and blessing it with enough precious spices to bury an entire royal household. This is what it is to be born again from above. To have our lives so completely transformed that we move from furtive questions in the dark to a full-hearted embrace of the one who is light himself. We stretch out these new bones. We call out our new names. We are given new hearts of flesh. There will be adventures along the way, some generic and some bold. But once we have been found by him, once we have entered into this new life, we will have taken our first breaths within a beautiful life that cannot and will not end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.